It's a bittersweet thing to be ending our fellows year. I'm deeply grateful to my fellow fellows um, uh, and uh, all the wonderful faces I see in the audience whose contributions I know do so much to make all of the work we're doing possible. I'm gonna be talking about algorithmic accountability and transparency with a punchline of it in the criminal justice system. My title is, you're just complaining because you're guilty, which uh, I will explain a little bit more in a minute. Um, Audrey encouraged me to uh, have some hope in this talk, and it's gonna start out uh, a little less hopeful, but it's gonna end with some good news. So opaque algorithms and platforms are making really big decisions about our lives these days and reshaping how we interact with one another. We see that around us all the time. How we get jobs, how we find friends, how we navigate city streets. Um, all of these things are increasingly algorithmically mediated. And when we can't understand the way in which that is done, there is a lot of opportunity for mischief. Algorithms are typically optimized not for individuals or for societies, but for efficiency and for reduced risk for decision makers, which in some sense is fundamentally at odds with considering individuals and unique circumstances. And platforms are optimized for advertising and engagement, or in other words, addiction. And not necessarily for healthy human relationships or mental health or healthy governance. What incentives do we have to debug individual cases of injustice? What incentives do we have to identify vulnerabilities and unintended harms? What will it take for us to debug these systems, not just for the people who paid to develop them, but for the individuals about whom decisions are made or the individuals impacted and society as a whole. There's a lot of questions we could ask in this space. What, do, what ability do we have to understand and challenge decisions that are made? What evidence do we even have that decisions are working the, or that, uh, that systems are working as they were designed to work and that they're reliable in a specific case can we identify when they just have completely wrong information about us and they're making decisions on that basis? Or can we identify when they might have correct in information, but they don't have the whole picture and that that's leading them to what we believe to be an unjust or incorrect decision? How can we protect systems against manipulation? And overall, how can we iteratively make these systems better when there are so many roadblocks to understanding how they work and the way in which the, those deployed systems are actually impacting individuals, even if they were developed with the best of intentions. There is a rich set of evidence that there's trouble, that we need to be paying attention to these things. And I'll, I'll go through just a, a few examples. I'm, I'll be curious to know how many of these examples are familiar to all of you. Um, this picture here I find is an interesting one. Um, some researchers do what many uh, machine learning researchers do. They had a set of photographs of dogs and wolves and they divided them into two and they lay, humans went and labeled some as dogs and some as wolves and then they said to the machine learning system, see if you can figure out how to tell. And then they tested the system on the remaining and they said, oh, it's very, does a very good job of, of saying whether it's dogs or wolves. And in this particular case, it was able to export an explanation of the decision. So it's highlighted portions of the picture uh, that it believes is relevant to its decision. And you can see that it's highlighted the snow. So the snow doesn't have anything to do with being a wolf or not, right? And as I often like to say, uh, we're all going to be dogs in the snow, and we're going to say, I am not a wolf, I'm a dog. And the question is, will we have anyone to say that to? Will anyone care? Will we even know the way in which we were labeled incorrectly? Another example 
is there's a wonderful paper, uh, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. Why would I say such a thing? This is what they did. They took, not hate speech or heavily biased speech, Google News. You'd think, you know, that's a decent thing to learn from. And they um, digested this text and they built a series of word embeddings that you can play games with. You can say things like man is to woman as king is to, and the system will say queen. And you're like, that's amazing. How did you get that from just ingesting all of this Google news? But then you say things like man is to woman as computer programmer is to homemaker. And then you use those word embeddings to guide the way resumes are sorted for applicability for a job, for example. And the mischief in these cases came in the training data. Another great example is a project, the Gender Stage project, that has shown that automatic um, facial recognition classification of gender is much, much more error prone on dark skin and female faces because they weren't tested, they weren't built that way. So we have training data, we have testing data, and these have real impacts on individuals and the applicability of these software systems to any particular use. Much of the problem is that we learn from the way people do things and we learn from the past, which those aren't bad things to learn from, but they are fundamentally flawed and biased. And if we just slap a label on them that says perfectly unbiased, logical, cool, almost infallible decisions made by a computer, then we have a big, big problem. We need to be iteratively improving, debugging these systems. So I began the year concerned about this, and I acted this out by um, working with a bunch of other people to come up with a kind of a high-level set of principles for algorithmic accountability and transparency. And you can read more about those principles if you'd like. They were awareness, access and redress, accountability, explanation, data provenance, audibility, validation, and testing. And I think that was very useful because it's given professionals a place to point to when they say we're building a system and it ought to do these things, we should invest in doing these things. Uh, major professional societies say that this is ethical and this is important when we build systems. So that was good. But this year I got a chance to be involved in applying some of these principles to a very particular and important case of probabilistic genotyping software in New York. That's a long mouthful, right? Probabilistic genotyping software is the stuff that if you have an evidence sample that's collected from a crime scene and you have a suspect and their DNA, will tell you how likely it is that there's a match, right? And things like that can be really, really hard science when you're dealing with very clean samples you know, a lot of DNA um, uh, populations you're used to, things like that. But when you get evidence samples that have an unknown number of contributors or are very, very small um, or perhaps are taken from populations you didn't even test your system on, there's reason to, th there's clear examples of trouble. And these probabilistic systems were designed to come in in exactly those cases, in exactly the cases that are difficult for humans to just look at the picture and see if there's a match. These systems will process the data and, and say whether they think there's a match. So there was a particular software product that was actually developed with taxpayer dollars by um, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in New York City. It was called the Forensic Statistical Tool. And it was used for more than five years in over a thousand cases. And all that time, they aggressively um, pushed back against third party review. Even to the degree that if defense attorneys wanted an expert to go in and look at things under protective order, no dice. 
you can't go in and look. So you get a number, says you're very likely to be the, the, the perpetrator, and you're going to jail because it's a very, a very trusted system. And you don't have an opportunity to question their math or to go in and say, did you make an error in my particular case? And in many instances, that evidence alone is enough. That's pretty stunning, wouldn't you say? Um, so some good news is that last year in one particular case, the judge said, yes, you can have an expert witness go in under protective review and examine the system. And they found, you know, they put out their findings. Originally, it was released um, heavily redacted, but they found lots of problems. And um, so much so that eventually their, their testimony was released unredacted, and ProPublica was able to get the whole source code of that system up on GitHub. So that is a stunning and hard-fought victory for transparency. It's interesting to see is who is doing the debugging is journalists and individual defense attorneys, not the system doing you know, aggressive third-party review. And I'm happy to say that I'm part of a very multidisciplinary team with lawyers and statisticians and journalists and forensic biologists who are taking that hard-won victory of the FST source code being, pub being published on GitHub and getting to the bottom of how much the errors in that system matter. We are doing executable level testing, source code analysis, comparison testing to other systems, especially open source systems. Here, I don't think you can see the details, but I'll, I'll tell you, there's this function, check frequency for removal, that was identified by the, the Nathan Adams who did the expert review in that case. And even if you don't read code, even if you write code, if you just read this, for each data row in the race table, if the frequency sum is greater than 0.97, remove is true. That doesn't sound very good, does it? And it was very much contrary to the way they said the system should be working. Our MAGIC grant is going to work in three major areas, journalism, technology, and in the legal system. In journalism, we're hoping to do kind of exposés, busting the myth of infallible, unbiased decisions made by computers and by DNA, hopefully highlight personal uh, stories. I'm, we're also gonna just write scientific papers comparing the systems. And I'm really excited. We're going to be at DEF CON, as is Nicole translating, I believe, <laughs> um, talking very similar. You're just complaining because you're guilty. A DEF CON guide to adversarial testing of software used in the criminal justice system. We're hoping to get hackers and citizens who can do something looking at these systems. And in the legal front, we wrote an article for uh, the champion, um, which goes to all federal judges and def defense attorneys, opening the black box defendants' rights to confront s forensic software. And we're working on language for the procurement phase where bef when, when systems are being purchased to guide big public decisions like this, that you can lobby for source code access or even easy executable level testing or design documents or access to bug databases or bug bounties or so many things that would help. Um, I think I'm gonna jump here to the bottom line, which is, Algorithms and platforms are increasingly making big decisions about individuals and reshaping our society. We desperately need incentives and mechanisms for iterative improvement of these systems so that when we find harm to individuals and that there's someone who cares to debug, that they don't just say, oh, we don't care about that individual case. It works 99% of the time, we're good, right? And the criminal justice system is not the only place where this matters, but it is a great example of where it matters. So that the only answer given to people isn't just, you're just complaining because you're guilty. That we actually get to the bottom of this. Thank you.